In this lecture, I'm going to talk about agitation and shear. So what is the impact on the cells? Why do you actually need agitation? And we're going to do some first basic calculations. So these basic calculations are going to be around the power number, which is the power that's required to drive the agitator. And once you know how to do that, you will be able to determine the oxygen transfer rate and the evolution of heat transfer, as we'll do in later lectures. First of all, why do you actually need the mixing? So you remember in a bioreactor, it's very important to keep optimal conditions. So we need this constant supply of oxygen because they consume oxygen really fast. So remember, this can be within up to like seconds. So constant supply of oxygen, keeping the pH very constant, vitamins constant, constant supply of nutrients. So it's very important that we have an agitator uh, to actually uh, make sure that we drive this. Yeah, so the choice of impeller in that respect is quite important. So we'll talk about different impellers that we, that we have and which ones are quite important uh, for bioreactors. Now, the first thing that we need to discriminate between is between radial and axial impellers. So if we talk about radial impellers, uh, that means that it goes along the radius of the tank. So you see the flow will go like this, so along the radius. Yeah? Uh, which will mean that if you have your impeller, you would have a vortex below the impeller and above it. If you would have the axial impeller, the flow would not go along the radius, but it would go around like this. So if you want to, to kind of see how this actually works, there's a, a YouTube video within the page so you can see what happens if we have two different dyes, how these impellers work and how they disperse. Now, in the sense of in, uh, in the bioreactors, the radial impellers have the advantage that they generate a lot of shear. So if they generate a lot of shear, uh, that also means that you're mixing, so you, you get um, a turbulent vortices. And these turbulent vortices are, are very good for dispersion of gas. And your typical radio impeller would be the Rushton turbine. So the Rushton turbine has its six pitch blades. Uh, and these ones are quite often used in bioreactors. Now, when we're looking at axial impellers, uh, those ones, as you said, the flow will kind of go like this. They have a, a different angle of attack. And the advantage that you have there is that you require relatively less pumping power. So the, the energy input that you have to do in that respect is less. But they're less beneficial for gas dispersion. So you will see often they uh, lean towards uh, the radial impellers. So here you can see how big these impellers can actually get. And while mixing is absolutely necessary, the disadvantage of a mechanical uh, mixing include that you generate heat, which can damage your cells, but also the shear forces can damage the cells. Now this one I briefly wanted to show because there are, uh, as I've talked about, that these radial impellers are the most common. There are examples of where you can use axial impellers as well, and this type of intermesh impeller is quite like a common one. Um, so what you would see sometimes you would have like a multi-stage uh, type of setup, so it's not always the case if you just have one impeller. It can be quite beneficial to have uh, two or three impellers that are positioned in different places as uh, because in general this will reduce the power and it will make sure that your oxygen transfer rate increases so it reaches the whole of the reactor and you can imagine when we're talking about scale up this becomes more and more important please also note the baffles that are installed on the in the sites because they they do promote the mixing like they do in heat exchanges promoting the heat transfer what is the main driving force for how you decide which impeller to select and generally say it will depend on the viscosity. So since the viscosity in most of the bioreactors is similar to water, we tend to uh, use either this Russian turbine that I talked about before or marine type of propeller. If we were going towards a uh, more viscous mixture, so there are some uh, examples here like rinsant and gum, so gum you can imagine quite sticky, quite viscous, then you would be more looking at other types of impellers like uh, helical type of impellers, or an anchor type of impeller. For the power calculations we're going to do, the first thing we need to determine is the Reynolds number. So we need to look at whether the flow is turbulent or laminar. So the regime in which is turbulent and laminar, so please note, look at the slide, is a little bit different from standard chemical engineering. Now, looking at uh, the formula, there's two, well, there's mainly three things that can go wrong. So the impeller speed is in hertz, so it's in second. Uh, whereas we'll see this is normally provided in RPM, so you will need to convert that first. Then we need to make sure that we take the diameter of the impeller, so not of the tank, 
And then also when it comes to the viscosity, we need to look at, you can either fill out the kinematic viscosity, which you might have seen, or we look at the viscosity divided over the density. We all know the, the Reynolds number as a mixing in vessels, and you don't particularly need to know this one, but I just wanted to show it to you. There is another number that we can use, and this is the, the Froude number, so FR. Um, I'm not going to go into detail this one, just be aware that in order to determine the mixing in some of the books, you might come across that one as well. Now, the one thing you have to take into account is that we're looking at the gas within the reactor. So you will see uh, that obviously if you imagine you have like something which is very dense, very solid, and as soon as you've got air bubbles in it, it becomes a lot lighter. So this is the example where you look at chocolate pudding versus chocolate mousse. The mousse will obviously be easier to mix because you've got the bubbles in there. And in a bioreactor, you will see something very similar. So you see in general with the, uh, the content of the gas that we have within the reactor, it usually takes roughly only about half the power to mix uh, the, the, the liquid. But you will see, so 50% is roughly the average, and, and, and often in calculations you would see that the number like that you have to uh, correct for the, the power input will be given, and it would always range between 40 and 60%. So in this graph you can see that the power number does depend on whether you're working on the laminar flow, where there is a dependence of the power number with the Reynolds number, whereas in the turbulent range the power number is independent of the Reynolds number. So if you're working according to that scenario, you can just use equation 3 from the previous slides and directly calculate the power from the, the power number. However, if you're working in the laminar range, you will see that there is a dependence of the Reynolds number and you will need to work with a certain constant, which I will talk about in the next slide. Now, thinking about it, you can see that the lines, they vary, so the different colors belong to different types of impellers. So you will also see that depending on the impeller, you would use a different power number. And here you can see the dependence of the power number in the laminar regime, where we're working with a constant K1, and in the turbulent region. So in the turbulent region, in practice, we just read off the power number from the chart that's provided. I have to touch on them is the concept of flooding. The flooding is very different than in your reactor than you would see in, a, in normal light. So what it actually means, and this is a particular problem in scale up, so we'll look at this a little bit later. So if you increase the, the sparging, so if you have more and more oxygen going into your reactor, if your impeller speed is relatively low, your oxygen kind of escapes from the reactor, but it would not have reached all the cells. So what it basically means, even though there is enough oxygen, so your, side, your cells will die off because it hasn't been distributed appropriately over your reactor. So take that into account. So this is a very important aspect that if we go to a bigger reactor, that we need to scale the impeller speed appropriately. Now we've talked about how important agitation is, and there's going to be a few slides about the impact of shear. Now bear in mind, in general, we're working with Newtonian fluids. So Newtonian fluids is where the shear is independent uh, of the shear rate. There are a couple uh, of cases where this is not the case. So think of, for instance, the santine gum that I mentioned before, or like filaments where you've got like, bacteria that grow uh, like this. So you've got like these filament types of filling and they, they behave slightly differently uh, in, in when they are exposed to shear. But we'll talk about generally what you have when you have microorganisms, when you've got E. coli in your tank, what happens then in terms of shear formation. Uh, in, in, in this picture you can see a good example of what it means and how it depends on the Reynolds number. So is your Reynolds number relatively low? You will see there is some shear kind of around the impeller itself, but not throughout the whole reactor. And this can pose a problem in the sense that when we were talking about this flooding, that the shear throughout the whole reactor is not sufficient uh, in order to kind of make sure that the oxygen is dispersed appropriately. Because if your bubbles are not being broken, you end up with a relatively uh, low surface area, which is not sufficient for the oxygen transfer rate. So when we increase the Reynolds number, so if we go along the graph, you will see that the shear will increase. Yeah? So it's more likely that you will have these turbulent vortices, which you could imagine in the first case would be better for your oxygen transfer rate. However, you will see that there's an optimum here and we just can't increase the shear until a, a certain point. So the radial flow impellers that we often use within these bioreactors are actually quite well known to generate a lot of shear.
which you can see from one aspect, this would be beneficial. So you get these kind of turbulent eddies um, that will make sure that these vortices that, is, that are good for gas dispersion. However, as I said before, these microorganisms are roughly the same size uh, as air bubbles. So they will feel the forces of these turbulent eddies. And you will see that these microorganisms they all kind of tend to twist as well. So as soon as they are exposed to too much shear, they're quite easily damaged. And particularly, this is the case of plant and animal cells. So you will see if you're working uh, with these two concepts, and we'll show an example of how they actually produce corn. Um, then we look at alternative bioreactor designs where you don't have this mechanical type of mixing. So in summary, you should be aware of why agitation is so important to promote mixing. You should know what different impellers are used in bioreactors and which one are more common and why. But also you should be aware of the disadvantages that come with mechanical mixing, which means it can damage the cells. So therefore, in later lectures, we'll discuss what alternatives you would have available. Furthermore, you should be able to undertake basic power number calculations, and if you want to give it a go yourself, have a look at the page at the example that is provided.